So welcome to Athabasca University, supporting students with disabilities in online learning environments. This webinar is ho being hosted by the Network of Assistive Technologists on this Friday, the 26th of June, 2020. And Athabasca University has been delivering education online for quite some time, always exploring new ways to support students who are eligible for accommodations. Of note, 2020 is their 50th anniversary, so congratulations to Athabasca University. And today we are joined by Lisa Boone and Samantha Thorburn from Athabasca to discuss the various ways that they provide services at a distance. They're going to discuss alternate format assistive technology assessment and training, as well as exam delivery and how they responded to the current pandemic situation specifically with modifications to the, to the delivery of services that would typically require in-person support, such as accommodated exam and vigilation. So I now hand the presentation over to uh, Lisa and Samantha as they start their screen sharing and bring us today's presentation. And there's that silence while I, uh, well, even though I practiced, forgot uh, a couple of steps. Thank you so much, Doug, for the, the introduction. My name is Lisa Boone and I have, I'm the Accommodation and Assessment Specialist for Accessibility Services at Athabasca University. And I have Samantha Thorburn here with me. Um, she's the alternate format I call her my unicorn because she's also um, one of the individuals who is working from home with small children um, and still stays on top of all the alternate format and uh, requests and managing all that. Um, I also tend to rely on her. I've only been with Athabasca University for the last year or so in this position, so she tends to be um, my uh, my go-to person when I have questions on those unique situations. So what I'd like to start with first is just kind of a bit of an introduction about Athabasca University and the, the history behind um, AU. So it was originally designed as a distance university in 1970. So one of the, some of the unique things about it is that it was an open door admissions policy. Right now, if you're 16 years old, you can apply to become a student at Athabasca University and, uh, and, and start registering in classes. The other thing that we also have is in-house production of learning packages. So this was fairly unique. Um, and to this day, we do really encourage a lot of our, um, our teams is, is all done in-house, that, that uh, production. The other thing about it is that we're an asynchronous learning environment. So students are learning at their own pace um, and rather than attending an actual, like in a brick and mortar, um, an institution with classes. In 1972, the, it was the concept of an Alberta Academy. So essentially we were set up so that we could also evaluate courses and provide the credit so towards a degree. Um, and then way back in 1980, that is when we first initiated the move to online delivery, which was pretty new back then. And then in 1984, we actually built our physical campus in Athabasca and, uh, and we have satellite locations in Edmonton, Calgary. And in 84, we had one in Fort McMurray, but that was actually closed in 2000. Okay, and so uh, quickly, we are fully accredited and, and a publicly funded institution through the province of Alberta. We are also a comprehensive academic and research university. We are also accredited with the United States uh, in, on higher education of the Middle States Commission. And then over 350 collaborative agreements with institutions across Canada and internationally. 
one of the things that we're also dealing, well, dealing, um, I shouldn't put it quite that way, but one of the things that we are currently facing um, is that we do have a, a, new, a fairly new president at, at our helm, and he has brought into play the Imagine Learning Plan. And it's, it's really revising how AU comes to at, at online education. And part of that is a comprehensive five-year IT strategy. So not only are we dealing with COVID changes and the restrictions and how it's impacted our students, but we're also undergoing a massive change in our integrated learning environment, our student record keeping. Um, and so that's, uh, that's fun in any given situation, but in the middle of COVID, it makes it particularly um, there's, it presents some challenges. So a couple of things, a few things about AU that's a little bit different um, that I thought I'd put up here, um, just because I know when I started with Athabasca University, it was sometimes hard to wrap my own head around. Um, like I would mentioned before, we are asynchronous learning environment, so course content is posted and students work through it. When it is a non-funded student, they, uh, they have a six month term. The other thing that we, we also offer is a rolling enrollment. So there's no semesters or terms. Um, as long as you register by the 10th of the previous month, you start in the next month. So if, if you register by May 10th, you're in the June classes. The other thing that we also, uh, we don't have professors, we have tutors. So the tutor is there to facilitate learning and they're not actually teaching content. And so then tutors are assigned blocks of students and then are, the students um, are provided with their tutor, uh, their virtual hours. And a lot of this communication is usually done via uh, online forums or by email. And then we have a course coordinator who is the person who's responsible for that particular course. Um, they're the ones who design it. Um, they oversee it and uh, as well as oversee the course tutors. So with regards to AU students, um, we have over 40,000 students, um, approximately 7,800 full-time uh, equivalent, um, over 850 and 55 plus undergrad programs in arts, science and professional disciplines. Um, we really have students across Canada. I know I have worked um, with students in, in our own department, literally across Canada, and, pro and I, can, I can think of off the top of my head about six other countries. Um, and then the un average undergrad is 27, average grad is 35. 73% work while they, they study. And most of those students, in my experience, have been working full time, as well as 30% of our, 31% of our grads are the first in their family to earn a university degree. And then when we start talking about students who are registered with our department, students with disabilities. So Athabasca University has the highest number of students with a very verified disability, we also have the highest number of students with a dual diagnosis. Right now, we have approximately 6,000 students registered with accessibility services, and we have seen an increase of 6.9% from last year. And I just heard some numbers um, just recently that our overall, with COVID, our overall um, registration has increased. One of the things that we often find is that the very structure of how we deliver education at Athabasca University is considered an accommodation for many individuals, especially those with ongoing medical uh, challenges where that requires a lot of um, doctor visits or they're hospitalized. Um, does this, this allows them to work at their own pace um, as, again, with medical conditions where they have really good days and really bad days. On good days, I have a lot of students who just pound through their work. And then on days where they're not able to, that's when they kind of set back and rest. So 
Athabasca University Accessibility Services is actually at, right now um, on paper called uh, Access to Students with Disabilities. Um, but we have determined the name change is coming. So our department tends to refer to ourselves as Ac Accessibility Services, waiting for everyone to catch up. So we do um, like a, a comprehensive from intake to um, assessing for accommodations, providing students with that letter, AT assessments, training, alternate format, funding applications. We also work a lot with faculty um, on understanding the duty to accommodate and how that looks for their course, understanding bona fide academic requirements, um, student advocacy. We do also provide student monitoring and follow-up exam processing and accommodations. So most of the service I think that are typically provided in a brick and mortar institution, we provide those as well. We just do them through a combination of video conferencing, telephone appointments and email. Um, at our institution, um, we used to have a variety of different platforms where video conferencing was used. Uh, but since COVID, um, IT has really uh, started promoting the use of Teams, providing us with, a, with multiple training opportunities, and, uh, and has really endorsed Teams as, as our video conferencing tool. Um, I personally have fallen in love with Teams and have found that I can use it for just about anything. So, Quickly about our intake and assessment. So it all is triggered by student disclosure, and I'm sure that's similar to just about any other institution. Um, when students apply to Athabasca University, they can check off if they have a disability, and we get our department gets a monthly report um, on that disclosure, and then we reach out to them. Um, sometimes what happens is a student will disclose to a tutor or a course coordinator and they are either referred to us or they are told about our services and come talk to us. And then they are also, often we have students who contact accessibility services. One of the things that um, all of our faculty across the board have been really good about is in their courses, in the very beginning of their course in the introduction, there is a posting there about if you require accommodations, please reach out to accessibility services. So some, for some students, that's the first time they realize that they can get accommodations is when they go into their course. Um, we usually reach out and give them what we call our verification of accommodation, VOA, and then what we require for medical documentation. And they return it either via email, they fax it, and some, some people even still mail it. Once we receive their VOA, we have an accommodation and support services advisor who assesses for those accommodations. If there's more complex accommodations for that individual, then it gets referred to the accommodation and assessment specialist. We also have a student system um, that is set up according to privacy laws and certain people have access to see that these, that this student has accommodations. <clears throat> Pardon me. So once it's all been assessed, the student is uh, sent by email a letter of their accommodations assessed as well as an accessibility services handbook. Um, it's all done by email. The students are always directed to share their accommodation letter with the course coordinator on their start date. Um, students who have more complex accommodation plans, uh, for example, things like alternate form of assessment or memory aids, they're directed to contact our office the minute they register in a course. Um, right now, our systems don't have any triggering event to let us know a student is registered or starting in a course. So it is their responsibility to contact us to initiate those, um, those conversations. So at this point, I'm going to send it over to Sam. Because um, she is, uh, she's our expert on the alternate format. And I'll, without further ado, Sam, I'll give it to you. 
Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Samantha Thorburn, and I am the Accessibility and Assistive Technology Administrator in our department. Um, I've worked with AU since 2009, minus a couple of mat leaves that Lisa referred to. So I've been able to witness our AF services kind of evolve over time as the university has also changed the way they're delivering course materials to, to students. So that's been kind of neat. So I'm just going to give you a general overview um, of what we're providing to students in terms of format. I know that AU courses are probably set up a little bit differently than some brick and mortar institutions about how students are getting their material. And then I'll also just let you know about how we're going about finding these alternate formats for students. So we're assisting students with a variety of needs, just like for any other accommodation. So that it could include print auditory visual or physical access challenges. Um, once they request their alternate format material, at that initial point, we're doing um, a brief assessment by one of our accessibility team members, mostly to ensure that what we're providing to them in terms of a service is matching what they need in relation to their disability. So we need documentation um, at that initial onset when they're applying for services with our office, and that usually supports their request. Um, and then from there, we need to consider what the impact is of their disability, what type of material they're looking for, and just evaluate what resources we have in our department at the time. Um, I'm pretty much the one that's getting material for our unit, minus some help with um, various aspects from other um, colleagues of mine. So we just need to really see what they're looking for and how we can meet that. So. It's usually in related to the um, impact of their disability and not a preference. So there are quite a few courses that have online textbooks right now. Um, and some students disability or not may prefer a hard copy books. So if they come to us just wanting a hard copy as a preference, then that unfortunately that's not something we're able to assist them with and we'll give them other methods that they can get that book. Um, at AU, there's a combination of both textbooks and AU produced content. So that can include study guides, course manuals, assignment manuals. It can be online reading such as articles. Some courses have a mixture of hard copy materials. So a students are shipped a course package at the beginning of their course that might still contain print hard copy textbooks. Um, and then a and then other online material. And some courses are completely online. So they have an electronic textbook and then other online material to supplement that. And the last thing there I was gonna also say is that we don't usually um, assist students with their supplemental material. So if they need to find a whole bunch of research articles and it's up to them to find it, we're not, we just don't have the resources usually to assist them with that. But if it's related to something required for their course, such an as assignment and it's not accessible, then of course we'll jump in to help them out. And just to interrupt there, Sam, one of the other things that we often do is assist them in tracking down funding um, to purchase their own OCR software. Um, Cause we actually read into this last, um, in the last year where we had a student who, there was a lot of supplemental readings and then he would only realize afterwards and he would submit his request and Sam wanted to provide it to him in a timely format. So then we ended up finding um, some resources for him to be able to purchase Kurzweil 1000 um, so that he didn't have to wait for us to, to convert it. Yeah, thanks Lisa, that's a good point. Okay, so I'm just gonna um, go over the types of material that we usually provide to students. Our two main formats would be an electronic copy of print material and sometimes even an electronic copy of material that's already delivered online. So a lot of the AU courses use um, electronic books in a platform called VitalSource. Um, for some students, it's great, it allows them to highlight. Other students, it doesn't work so well with their assistive technology or however they're trying to study with it. Um, there are sometimes some barriers on how much you can print. So if you have some students that want to print out sections, they run into some troubles with those e-texts. So um, we're there to provide e-texts for students that need it. On the flip side, we have quite a few students that also require hard copy material. So they're not able to use the online material. So we're assisting them with that. 
Uh, we do provide uh, Braille services. I can't remember an instance where we had to Braille an entire textbook, but we do have students that utilize uh, e-text that we send out to a transcriber. We'll send them the textbook. The transcriber will make um, an e-text, usually in Word with producer's notes, and then they supplement Braille and tactile graphics um, where they aren't able to describe that in the text. And then we can print out that Braille and graphics for the student. Um, we also do produce some Kurzweil uh, files for students. So if they don't have funding, the resources we have would allow us to send them just some unzoned KESI files. So at least we're uh, saving them in the format they need. However, we do have some students that have received funding for KESI files. So I can go in there, zone them properly, make sure it's gonna read it aloud correctly and we can send them that. Um, for any AU produced multimedia material, um, we need to ensure that we're giving them text transcription. So that may be working with our course production departments or the course coordinator. And then we haven't had too many of these, but um, again, for AU produced material, if we need to assist with an alternate layout, so color or spacing, font size, et cetera, then we can assist students with that. So um, when students do require alternate format material, we usually recommend that they notify us about three to four weeks before they want to begin a course. This is to ensure that we have enough time to get the material that we need from publishers or printed out. If they need a complex format such as Braille, we're usually telling them they need about eight weeks. Um, it doesn't mean they can't request material mid-course, but we just give them that caveat that it might take a few weeks, so they may have to um, get by with what they have or wait a little bit. So we're really encouraging them to try to do it before their course begins. Um, sometimes we need to provide a similar alternative to what they request. So a good example of this is we do have quite a number of students who want audio produced files of their textbooks or online material. Um, when I started, we had enough resources to do that for the students, but now we've grown so big that we just don't have enough to do that. So our workaround is often to provide them with an e-text and we have a site license for read and write. So they can load that e-text or PDF file into their read and write program. And that seems to be a good solution for a lot of our students. Um, Lisa was talking about funding a little bit there, but we do provide it on a cost recovery basis when we can. So we're not telling students that they need funding in order to access our services. However, when we have the opportunity to apply for that, um, we submit it on their application or we also submit for equipment so that they can apply for a printer or other assistive technology to do some of this work on their own. So our process in general is for students, like I said, to submit a request to our office so that we have a request form to do that before their course starts. Um, and then we need to do a brief assessment if it's their first request. So we're just I'm comparing what they're asking for in the email or on the phone with their documentation. I'm going over what type of a technology we're using and we're just having that discussion with them to make sure what we're gonna to provide to them is lining up with what they need. Um, at AU, we're a little bit unique because the cost of materials is included in the cost of the course. So we don't have a bookstore like a, a brick and mortar institution would. So there is a learning resource fee that's included in the courses. Um, students pay that once they're registered. So if there's hard copy books, it's shipped to them. Um, otherwise, the learning resource fee includes all of those online textbooks, reading, study guides, etc. So myself, um, I know that a student has paid for their material once they're registered in the course, um, which comes in handy if we have any pushback from publishers who need receipts. I'm not in a position where we can provide any receipts because of how our course is structured. However, once I explain how our students register and that I can confirm they're registered without giving any specifics about who it is, I can give them a course syllabus and then they're usually okay proceeding from there. So after that, um, I usually acquire e-text from publishers or we need to scan the books. At that point, I would order any hard copy textbooks we need or contract out Braille if we're looking a few months in advance. Um, after that, any electronic material or Kurzweil material is edited and then we print in-house our own hard copy of the AU produced material and then also the Braille. Um, for distributing the material, um, the electronic material is usually sent to students through Dropbox. That seems to be working well for us. Smaller files, sometimes I just email. 
Um, and we start to use SharePoint in Office 365 because they use students do have access to that. For shipping out hard copy material, um, for Braille, we usually just take it to the post office. They'll ship it for free with a tracking number in Canada. So that works out really well for us as well. Um, we store our electronic files after so that we can use them in the future. And we track all of our um, requests really carefully so that we can compare them later with a student has re-request another course, we can go back to see what they did. So now I'm just gonna talk about where we get our material. So. For students that need electronic material, if they need a textbook, I'm typically requesting these files from the publishers first. So my main places to find this would be to go to the publisher's website. A lot of the big ones have an online request form, or if it's a smaller publishing company, I'm looking for that permissions department and then I usually email them. Um, I've been using Access Text Network a lot lately. I find them really helpful. If they're not able to provide the file, often they'll at least it'll give you the link to where you should go, go request that file from another publisher. Um, and then I check other sources like CELA, Bookshare, et cetera. Um, if we cannot get the electronic file from a publisher, we're very fortunate here that we have a course materials department that is still working on site in, in our warehouse in Athabasca. If they have a hard copy available, we have someone there who will um, take the book apart and scan it for us. So that's often a solution. It's becoming increasingly harder because AU has had to shift to more electronic material um, due to COVID because of shipping times and availability. But if the book is available, then that's definitely an option for us. For AU produced material, I'm, we have the ability to download files directly from the course websites. Most of them are in a platform called Moodle. Um, or I can contact our course production groups or course coordinators to help me get those files so we can edit them after that. And then online readings are also, of course, coming from the course websites, external websites, and our, our library at AU does um, host a website called the Digital Reading Room that has a lot of our, it's a one spot for students to download their course readings and they can assist me with getting those readings as well. If students need on the flip side, hard copy material. For textbooks, I'm usually ordering them from the publisher or Amazon. Um, occasionally we'll run, out, run into a book that's out of print. And so we're looking at used copies and students seem to be fine with that when they're looking for a hard copy. We just let them know that it's used and try to search for one in good condition. Um, some students still require a hard copy of AU produced material. Pre-COVID, when we were working in our office, we would just print it out right at our office. Now we're all working remotely. So again, we're really fortunate that there's still some colleagues in course materials that are working on site. So I collect all of the files for them in PDF. I send it to them, I share it with them, and then they will print it out and ship it to the student for us. And then the same thing goes for the online readings. If it's readings from the library, um, pre-COVID, again, they were printing them and mailing them to the students. We would just organize that request. Um, now it's going through course materials because we're limited who's on site and can do that printing. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, so with regards to AT assessments and AT training, um, as Sam mentioned, all AU students do have access to Read and Write. They also have access to Office 365. Um, we usually do AT assessments by telephone, video conferencing, and in some cases, we do it all by email, just back and forth. Um, sometimes we can get email threads that are about 30 emails long, but if that is their preferred method of communication, uh, we, we do that. Um, and then again, AT training uh, is provided through MS Teams, although this is, doing it this way is fairly new. Um, historically, I think in the past we used TeamViewer, but as I mentioned, I've become such a fan of MS Teams that that's usually where I'm doing it now, uh, just because we have that, uh, the video and, and desktop sharing capability right now, our courses, as I mentioned before, it's all posted, it, um, it's all, content is already available once their start date 
they have their start date. And they register into, or sorry, they, they log into their MyAU portal, and that's where their courses are listed. And then they have the ability to work through their courses at their own pace. When they're ready to write an exam, they just simply request it through their MyAU portal. Um, for the most part across AU, the, the courses are posted in Moodle. We do have a, a stray faculty here and there that runs their own system uh, or hosts their own in a different way. Uh, but that is changing with our RISE five-year technology plan where we're all going to be hosted in the exact same environment, which I'm sure Sam will be looking forward to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that we also, we do a lot of student supports. Um, while online learning is really fantastic for some students, other students really struggle with the transition of working at their, at their own pace. Um, so one of the things that we often right away will re recommend to students is to make an appointment with one of, uh, one of my colleagues, her name's Catherine, and she actually is, she turns it into magic. She works with them to build a study plan. And again, this is all done through video conferencing in Teams. And she works through the course syllabus and the requirements of the course and helps them break it down into manageable tasks. Um, I think it's magic how she breaks it down. And so she does this with the student with the intention that they'll be able to build this skill themselves. And once they know what they are, what's required of them in a course, hopefully they'll be doing it on their own. She will provide students with the, um, the templates to kind of work through it. And then when you've broken it all down, this is, this is actually, it's incomplete, but this is a sample of what they would receive. So they get daily tasks as well as weekly goals. And it's based on when are you willing to, to do your, like to complete coursework. Um, so, for example, you see here they've got flex days or days off. We also, if they have done a study plan, we do some mo uh, academic monitoring. We do it in a variety of ways. Um, again, just as a Teams fan, I have created some Teams with some students and they will actually post what they've done according to their study plan to show me this, with this particular student, um, she felt that actually giving me all this information really held her accountable. Um, so she would post her notes to me, and to be honest, it's physics, so it meant nothing to me. Um, but uh, she posted every day that she'd get something done and she would post it. And then sometimes what would happen is she, uh, I'd I wouldn't see a post from her from a few days. So I'd be able to go into our team and just really quickly post, hey, how are you doing? Is everything okay? Right, and then, and, and then we can sometimes help jumpstart her. The other thing that we also do is uh, emails. We also do uh, some telephone calls um, just because our time is getting stretched thinner and thinner. Um, I'm trying to avoid telephone calls and trying to rely on technology. Um, but we also use an online text messaging system where I can shoot students a text and say, how's your progress going? And I'll just touch base to see if they're in line with their, um, their weekly goals. And if they're not, then help them kind of plan out how they're going to get back on track. So exams was something um, that hit like Sorry, let me back up. So course delivery wasn't really impacted by COVID um, because it was already posted online already. And I know many institutions were scrambling trying to find a way how to, how to deliver content um, with the COVID restrictions. Where Athabasca University was really hit was in our exams, in our assessment process. So prior to COVID, Exams were delivered in a much learning environment, which is a browser that's locked right down. 
Um, and then the other one that we would use is Lotus Notes. Again, browser-based. Um, I believe that our Faculty of Business actually had just started using another um, browser-based uh, interface that, that, again, all locked down. And then we still had a lot of paper exams. So obviously, we're using a lot of on-site invigilation. We have on-site invigilation sites all over the world. <clears throat> Pardon me. So pre-COVID, when a student was ready to take an exam, what they would do first is they would schedule it with their invigilation site. So if they had an on-site invigilation center, they could go there. The other one that we also have that we use is ProctorU, and ProctorU is a digital proctoring service. Um, essentially what happens is they use, um, oh my goodness, my, and my brain is blanking, they use LogMeIn software so that the, in, the proctor is watching their screen and knows what their keystrokes are. They also offer artificial intelligence. Um, that, that flags the proctor when the student might be doing something that's considered cheating, um, as well as you do require the video camera. Um, so a lot more of our exams for many AU students, they were going the proctor U way to, be, to have their exams, um, just because it means you get to write uh, in much more extended time frames, like you could write it at night or on the weekend. Um, as well as from the comfort of your own home. And then from there, once they, the, pre-COVID, once they had um, scheduled it and knew when they were going to write, then they would request their exam through their MyAU portal. Once they checked off that they require accommodations in their exam request, the exam request is sent to our office to process. <clears throat> Pardon me. So again, the, a, like the challenges that we frequently faced is that all these browser-based exams, because they're so locked down, they don't allow for the layering of software, which means no assistive technology. And then obviously paper is not always an appropriate solution for some of the students that we serve. So our, 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 our fallback solution was on-site invigilation because then we could get the exam to the student in word format or, or whatever um, in order so that, they, so that they could take their exam. COVID had so many people scrambling. Um, so the courses, particularly in math, because so many of the browser-based exams um, they couldn't do symbols, and that's why we were relying on paper exams. So, for example, our, our math courses were all scrambling because we could no longer assess student learning with a paper exam. So, a lot of the student or a lot of the, the course coordinators then developed um, a combination of a take home exam um, as well as uh, a video conference with the student, and the student was was arranging those directly with their tutors. One thing that came out um, uh, for us to, that we learned with COVID, uh, particularly around the math courses and paper exams, is that we have a far higher number of students uh, with autism that are attending AU as an accommodation because there's limited social interaction when you attend AU. And now all of a sudden, um, they have to uh, video conference and, uh, and so we had an influx of, of student registrations um, because an accommodation they never needed before um, was, was something that, uh, that they, they needed to start arranging. So now with COVID, we have started relying entirely on ProctorU as our invigilation or, or for proctoring the exams. So now when a student is ready to take their exam, they, they request it through their MyAU portal. They'll check off that they require accommodations. Again, it's still sent to us. 
And if those accommodations are available in ProctorU, then they can go ahead and schedule with ProctorU. If we cannot provide the accommodations for students um, in our, uh, because those browsers are so locked down and they don't allow for the layering of technology, for example, um, we will reach out to the, the student and say, you're, like you're, you're, we're, we're not able to provide you this exam with ProctorU um, because we can't provide those accommodations. And then I'll work with the student and the course coordinator to find a different way to, to deliver the exam. And what it's really boiled down to is to try to figure out what, what the course coordinator is often worried about. So it, for example, um, with, because we're asynchronous, we could have hundreds of students at any given time in a month writing the same exam. So we don't have those big bulk writing, um, like you wouldn't have 200 students writing on a certain date. So a lot of course coordinators were extremely concerned about the security of exams. So one of the things that we started doing is we had developed a SharePoint site and what we would do is we would, at the time of the exam, um, one of the ASD exam or the accessibility services exams persons would um, share a folder and a file with them in OneDrive at the time of the exam. Then what would happen is they would log on together, like I, I hope you can see this picture. Um, so this is just a, a mock um, document. And what you see is you'll actually, when you're logged in together, you'll see the cursor of the student and you'll also see their avatar that they are logged in. Um, if they're a cited individual, you could use the comment box. Um, this has been used um, with a number of our partially sighted and blind students because it works very well with screen readers. <coughs> um, I actually had one uh, voiceover student who was pleasantly surprised at how easy it was because her, in her experience, Microsoft Word wasn't as accessible um, as they claim. So, um, Sometimes what will happen with a partially sighted or blind student is I'll just tell them they can write because we're keeping an eye on this. So we're seeing them go through the exam and we're making sure by watching it that they're only working in it in the online window. Um, and then at the end of it, they would tell us at the very bottom, they would just write in there. Hey, Lisa, I'm done. And then I would tell them to log out. I would watch them log out by leaving here. Um, and then um, I would unshare the folder and then forward along to the marker. The other thing that we ran into that security and invigilation was a requirement. Then we started invigilating in house. Um, this is something that's fairly new, like in the last week and a half. Um, so what we started doing is we create a, a Microsoft Teams class and then at the time of writing, we can upload the exam and then we can share um, or we can start the, a video conference with the student and they could load the file right there on the screen and because we have video, I can watch them while they're writing. So it's all hosted in here in the Word, or sorry, it's all hosted in the Teams environment and I can watch them at the same time as long as they're sharing their screen with me. But then we came to Kurzweil. We have a number of students who are using Co3000 as an accommodation. And unfortunately, the web tool does not work in where we couldn't get it to work. So if somebody else has, you know, some, insight to why that happened. I'd love to hear it, but we couldn't get it to work properly in the Word Online environment. So that's when we started tapping into Kurzweil 3000 and it was tested and it's going to be used next week for the first time. We've been on steep learning curves. 
So what we do is we just have some generic exam accounts um, that, and we'll use the universal library. At the time of the exam, it'll be, or shortly before the exam, it'll be uploaded into that folder. And then once we start our Teams video conference, that's when I'll share the login and the password uh, with the students so I can watch them log into their exam. So this is just using Teams as the video conferencing um, and then um, watching them take it. I'm not seeing, uh, I'm seeing their screen, I'm not seeing their environment. So there is situations where we're, we're acting in good faith. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of that, um, but sometimes it does take a little bit of a conversation um, with course coordinators to explain that it's not going to be absolutely guaranteed. They may have like a notepad beside them with, with some information. Um, my experience has been um, almost across the board that most of the students I'm working with, they're just grateful to be able to use their accommodations uh, to be successful. I've not had a lot of experience with cheating. Um, Definitely not. Um, and that's so like we did some juggling, but we're just we're always trying to find ways um, and figure and figure it out. We are hoping what we are doing is we do have a consultant coming in who's building a little bit more sophisticated of a SharePoint site for us. Um, because the one that we're currently using is one that I had built while learning SharePoint. Um, so we're hoping to get this consultant to build us a SharePoint site and it will do a lot of, it'll access a lot of the workflows and automate the process of placing an exam in there. And then we can start using ProctorU as well. Um, one of the things that we are currently discussing with ProctorU is um, their, their, their proctors have uh, a baseline of education and it might not be enough training uh, to understand accommodations or that or, or or how to communicate even accommodations with a student so what we're currently exploring is proctor u has what they have uh, what they call their proctor pro uh proctors and those are ones that receive a little bit more uh, more training and um and in servicing and uh and we we might start using those with like an online delivery method with the use of the SharePoint sharing. And that is pretty much um, the end of, of what we had to talk about. So I'd like to open it, before I open it up to questions, um, one thing, if you want more information about Athabasca University, um, athabascau.ca and then there's also our website asd.athabascau.ca and then of course if you have any questions please drop us an email we're all working remotely so we're not available by phone right now but please feel free to contact sam um, Carrie Anton is also the Accessibility Services Coordinator. Um, she's also a fantastic resource. She's been with the university um, 11, 12 years now. Um, so, and she's also really involved in our integrated learning environment transition. Um, and then you only get to contact me if you can read the small font. Doug, I'll, I'll let you, is there questions? Yes, there are uh, some questions. Um, I, I, I like that uh, method of uh, hiding behind the small font, uh, Lisa, <laughs> but I, I do have to, uh, how, how much time and where do I find the form to submit a, an accessibility uh, request or an accommodation request uh, for, for enlarged print? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> just bringing up the questions here. Um, anyways, it took if, me a moment. Was, I thought you were actually asking that question, Doug. Well, so 
my brain yeah, I, was processing. You, you were looking up the website address for me, were you? <laughs> I was thinking about it. I was like, I should, I should just email it to him. But then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, we're, we're all in, in reactive mode, I think, a lot of the time, especially now in, in the times that we're all living. So um, I, 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 I would suggest, uh, Lisa, if, if, that, if that is because the workload is just too much for you uh, to, to manage direct requests, then that, that's fair. But if, if you're comfortable with it, if you could maybe um, add your, um, your uh, email into the chat, that would be great. <laughs> that, I could definitely do that. I was being cheeky. I, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but at the same time. So um, I appreciate that. So I'll leave that up to you. Um, just going to go through some of the questions here that we have. And um, apologize. Uh, some reason I can't get that. There it is. So we've got a, a number of questions that have come through here. Um, there was uh, a person uh, um, asking about SELA um, that you had mentioned and I put into the chat just wanting to draw people's attention to it that I put the website for it and a brief description of what SELA or the Center for Equitable Library Access is and just also a note that there is on the uh, note, um, past events website there is a webinar that we uh, hosted that will give you more information quite in-depth information about SELA. So, um, Cassie has asked uh, a question here. Uh, do some of your course coordinators use OER, standing for Open Educational Resources, as part of their course material, materials? And are they in-house produced uh, materials? Uh, or sorry, are they in-house produced materials OER? Yeah, I can. This is Samantha. I can probably speak to some of that. Um, I've definitely run across some courses that do have OER materials, um, so that makes it very easy for us to assist our students. I don't know the part about the in-house produced materials, though I think they're probably only available for AU students that are registered in the course. Most of it's in our Moodle platform and they wouldn't have access to it until they're in their course. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay, great. It, it, I can add on to that if you don't mind, Doug. We all, it really depends on the course coordinator. Um, just like you would see in a, in a traditional institution, it's the course, the professor who's choosing which materials they're using, and it's our course coordinators who are doing that um, with AU. And some of our course coordinators are really, really big on the use of OER. Um, we actually, we have, some of our course coordinators have written OER resources and textbooks, um, but it's really dependent on that coordinator. Okay. All right. And uh, one of our participants, RD, has uh, um, asked if all students have access to read and write during remote operations, uh, uh, have multiple licenses for read and write software been purchased by your office? So just uh, to make sure I understood, so the read and write software um, yes. is, a, it, we have what they call a campus license so we pay an annual subscription and as long as the student uh, registers it with their .edu email address um, it licenses, licenses it directly to um, the, the local machine. Does that answer that question? Oh, I think it does. Um, and to add to that as well actually we had read and write pre-COVID so um, Luckily, a lot of our students were in place with that and they could continue just using it as everything was changing as well. Okay, great. And just before we continue with any of the questions from the chat, I just remind people to add their question into the chat or feel free to unmute their microphone and we'll uh, include them to be able to ask uh, their questions live. So if I do see anybody unmuting their microphone, um, I'll be happy to, uh, to call on you to, to, uh, to ask your questions. So. Um, so Nancy has uh, asked if you could give us the name of the text uh, software that you use to communicate with students. Um, I use textfree.us. Okay, so textfree.us. Okay, perfect. And uh, just checking for any microphones. I don't see any at, at this point. So we have a question from Colin. Um, and I think uh, Colin, part, there's a two part question to this is, did you need to clear the use of Microsoft Teams with your privacy office before it was used with students? 
Colin, that's an excellent question that I cannot answer. Um, I know that it was a unilateral decision that video conferencing was done through Microsoft Teams. And I have made the assumption that the privacy officer for AU is very aware of its use. And if there was a, a problem with using it, I, she's really on top of things we would have heard. Ask forgiveness later. You know, I tend to live by that, yeah. Okay. It's the motto of assistive technology, I think. Um, the creative solutions we have to come up with to get to, to get us through the day. So, and the second part to Colin's question, um, and he thinks you answered it, but uh, just to clarify for people, because it was a question I had as well, and is uh, what uh, platform were you using for the exam bookings? So... The bookings themselves is done through the My AU portal, um, which is just the student's landing page. Um, and oh, well, he did mention, I think you answered my questions, but the actual exams are delivered in those three methods um, that, didn't, that were locked down browsers. Okay, perfect. All right, and that was the last question that I was uh, keeping track of in the, um, oh, I apologize. Uh, there was another question here from RD. Um, uh, how tedious or easy has it been to have staff members monitor students over Teams and SharePoint, considering the immediate, uh, or the immense number of students registered with accessibility services? Depends on what kind of monitoring that you are referring to. Um, if you're talking about like progress checks, um, I, I, what I've, because the demand has increased significantly, um, I basically have a window of time that on Monday mornings, Wednesday mornings, and Friday mornings, students are made aware that that's what is, um, that's when I'll do the progress checks, and I can't do it outside of those times. Um, with regards to exam monitoring, the 0365, 0365 and like the alternative methods that we've been using, um, it's pretty much eaten up a full-time job. Um, and it, I keep threatening to start charging back faculty for every time they require um, invigilated exams. The way to pay the budget in one foul swoop. Uh, Colin has uh, unmuted and raised his hand, so Colin, go ahead. Oh, hi, Lisa. Uh, thank you for, for sharing everything um, today with us. Um, my question uh, is just really for clarification about the exam booking. You did mention that bookings are done through my AU. Sounds to me like that's uh, a customized uh, platform that your institution has created, or is there something behind that? I mean, my AU is probably just a landing page uh, that students go to, but is there an actual software or, or, or is the my AU the, the software that's used? So it is their, the secured website. So it has been built specifically um, for students of AU. Um, I don't know what back ends it. Um, I would anticipate that it is a custom build. Um, if I, like I can show you the page if that helps you um, and it walks them through it. Um, but as to, to what's back ending it, I, I'm so sorry, I have no idea. Um, Colin, were you seeing how it looked like? Um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if it was a uh, part of an accessibility or, or disability management system. I, I know that sometimes um, some institutions use clockwork, uh, some institutions use, um, you know, AIM. Um, I, I guess it depends on whether you're in Canada or in the U.S. Uh, if you're in Canada, there might be fewer choices based on um, privacy issues? Right, okay, so no, we do not use any system specifically uh, targeting uh, accessibility. Um, 
because we've actually we have as an organization we have looked at uh, clockwork um, but right now when a student requests an exam um, it is linked with um, banner and banner is the one that logs for lack of a better word um, exams the student has requested we're notified by email um, that the student has requested the exams. It, there's a lot of manual processing in there, but to actually track and book, um, that's been done through Banner. And uh, the manufacturer of that is, I'm going to say it wrong, Elu Elustian. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's possible that Banner could do that. We use Banner as well. Um, I, and it, I, I'm, we just don't use it in that capacity. Uh, it's, I know that some software um, allow the automatic booking, like they'll look for a seat and they'll actually calculate the time um, and, and all that sort of stuff um, based on parameters that have been preset, whether that uh, station is equipped with uh, specific um, technology, et, et cetera. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not that sophisticated there's more of a manual process involved, which is probably why we have two and a half people um, dedicated to processing exams um, in our department. Um, because, because we don't have um, a system dedicated um, for access accessibility services in that way, I think what has historically been done is tweaked the banner system to work well enough um, to, uh, to do it in, in a manual process. I mean, we do have a student communication system um, that is also being <laughs> reviewed right now and, and how we can update it because it's a really old system. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very manual process of, uh, of setting things up. Okay, just moving on. Um, I, I appreciate the uh, the um, looking at that uh, and unpacking it a little bit there. Um, just uh, before we move on, I should say is that uh, just to clarify for our audience, mm -hmm. some may not be aware of what Banner is and that um, Banner is uh, a student management system from a registrar's office perspective, primarily has a lot of other features in it, but um, some people may also be working with a system <laughs> called, P uh, called PeopleSoft and uh, that uh, has, is just to draw a, um, a comparison. And the, um, other thing I'm wondering to put it in perspective, uh, Elisa, if you could um, tell me if I'm on the right track, is that uh, that um, your landing page where people go um, is is a is possibly just a, an entry point into a back-end system such as Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle or something along those lines. I, you know what, I I would be guessing, and, and I can make all sorts of assumptions and guesses. Um, I apologize. I, I'm not that familiar with it. It's one of those things that has only kind of really come into my role because we were looking for solutions around COVID. Sam, do you have any insights? No, unfortunately, I don't think I do either. Students are definitely using Moodle in their courses um, to get into their actual course material, their study guides, student manuals assignments they sit, submit assignments through there they have online quizzes through there um, but besides Moodle I yeah unfortunately I just don't have other information what else AU is using in the back end okay all right so the mystery uh, remains um, <laughs> and uh, so um, I just we do have one last question uh, in the chat if anybody else has anything uh, we're just we are past time just a little bit but if there's any other final questions please enter them into the chat or again if uh, we see the microphone unmuted we'll uh, call on you but uh, we'll uh, at this point Catherine is asking uh, or making a comment here so screenshot reader in read and white read and write did not work and read the web in Kurzweil 3000 also could not read exams so I, I guess uh, Catherine's looking to clarify that so Catherine that's an awesome question yes screenshot reader in read and write will work um, 
but not in those um, traditional platforms that we use because the minute you click outside of the, the, the much learning or Lotus notes, then it shuts the exam down. Um, and most of the locked browsers do work that way. They don't layer. I know I read something, I think it was Doug that forwarded it along. Um, Respondus is right now working with text help in order to build the the uh, the read and write the, the read and write capabilities right into the browser. Um, in other settings like that we have been using, I I tend to be a little bit picky that a student using their technology shouldn't have to do a lot of extra work to access text in an exam. So for me, per, like it's again, it's just my personal, my personal opinion. Um, I tend to shy away from screenshot reader because it's, let's minimize the steps that a student has to use. So if it doesn't work in the environment, then we need to find a different way. And the read the web for Kurzweil in Word Online, we couldn't get it to work. Um, it may have been a glitch with my computer, but we couldn't get it to work. And we were in too much of a panic to try to troubleshoot shoot it and found that this would probably be a better solution for us. Okay, great. And yes, it was uh, through the note discussion list, uh, open to all note members. Plug yeah. for Note. If you're not a member of Note, uh, feel free to go to note.ca and, uh, and click the join link um, and join. It was through our note uh, or through our discussion list that that came uh, that information came out from one of our members. And I have had a conversation with Matt Brown, uh, one of the uh, representatives uh, for uh, for Text Help, and uh, he's enlightened me as to some of the background technical workings that need to take place for that to actually materialize and that his uh, development team is is definitely working hard on the uh, the respondus integration um, and it will arrive when it arrives quicker than her not as quick as we all want it to so no. um, just not I'm not seeing any other microphones unmuted so the last chance for that as I uh, um, present our last question here uh, and uh, from Colin he's wondering if there's been any consideration towards implementing equation editors for math based exams such as the equation editor in Microsoft Word, et cetera? Yes. <laughs> there has. Um, I know we have a number of faculty members who are actually exploring text helps equatio. Um, I have tried to have a number of conversations about um, equation editor in Microsoft Word with a number, like just one-to-one -one conversations. Um, have, you, have you ever experienced um, professors who they've, they've found their rhythm, they found their groove, and this is where they like to stay? Um, in the, in the, the conversations I've started having more and more these days, um, there's, there's some reluctance um, to really examine it and, and see if it is a, um, a, a quality solution. And I run away from math, so I need their expertise to tell me if it is sufficient. Okay. So, and, and none of us have ever experienced any of those kind of professors. Um, and in the real Unique world, to and, AU. Yes, absolutely. And uh, every, in, in the real world, everything always adds up and it will average out somewhere down the line. But um, as I was also told by a very astute professor one time is that 98.3% of statistics are made up 23.2% of the time. <laughs> so um, I don't see any uh, other questions having come into the chat and I'm not seeing any other microphones unmuted. So at this point, I think what we will do is we will uh, uh, wrap up and uh, Lisa and Samantha, I, I, I just would like to thank you for sharing all of this information with us today. Um, I would, I, I don't know how to summarize this other than it's fantastic. You can see the thank yous coming in in the chat here as well. Um, the fact that you guys have taken and pivoted um, and repivoted and 
probably repivoting as we speak. Um, you probably don't want to check your inbox and voicemail once this webinar is done. Um, and we so very much appreciate the fact that both of you have found the time in your schedules um, to be able to, to uh, share this information with you. And um, there's been a, quite a lot of interesting things that you've, uh, you've raised that might lead to some other webinars if I can uh, twist some arms in your department. So, um, warn, well, warn them so uh, to warn them to block my email address when you get when you get off this webinar. So, oh, sounds good. Well, thank you so much for inviting us. Um, it, uh, I wish we could have done it sooner, um, but yeah, like like everybody, right? Adapting to COVID has significantly um, increased a lot of our workloads. So I do thank you so much for your patience in, in, in getting us once you extended the invitation and a huge thank you to all the participants. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Perfect. And yes, I'll thank you finish, very much. Yes, we'll just finish up here with uh, just a, a, an answer to RD in the chat has asked if the video is going to be shared later and yes, a per, uh, replay uh, will be posted. So, so again, uh, thank you, uh, Lisa and Samantha, for sharing your support of the assistive technology profession, plus the, the network of assistive technologists. It's greatly appreciated. Um, our toolboxes are never never full, um, but we always find room. And I know that the the information you've shared today is going to find a find a home in all of our toolboxes. So um, please do keep in touch. I look forward to continuing this collaboration. And uh, lastly, for everyone here today, uh, thanks for joining us. Remember, you can't spell education without AT. And until next time, take care and stay safe.